Turn in your Bibles to Luke 15, and we're going to be looking at probably, if not one of the most memorable uh, accounts in all of, of the scriptures. Uh, but before we get there, is anyone familiar with the, uh, the idea of birth order when it comes to kids? And you know, I'm, I'm the oldest of three, and according to birth order, the oldest is usually kind of characterized how? Bossy, Bossy good. Like Leader. Perfectionist. Perfectionist. What else? Uh, not in my case, but yeah, we'll go with it. Lots of responsibility. Lots of responsibility. Um, um, what else? The biggest screw up, screw up right? <laughs> that could be true in my case. Um, would you say, um, responsible? Yeah. Would you say task oriented? Yes. Would you say strong willed? Yes. Would you say domineering? Yeah. So firstborn, I'm firstborn, my wife's firstborn. How we survive in marriage is beyond me, 29 years, grace of God. We'll chalk it up as that. How about if there, if so if there's three kids in a family, the middle child is usually described or, or, or um, can be identified as, as what? Perfect. Are you middle child? All right. Perfect, spotless, blameless. Um, some people have said the, thir- the middle child of three is adaptable, right? A mediator, go between, right? How about if you're the third born of three? Spoiled. Spoiled. Uh, Free spirited. <laughs> That's a polite way of saying they just do whatever they want to do, right? Uh, it's interesting, huh? Now, I, there's one group that we're, I just refuse to talk about, and that's the only child. So we'll talk about that another time. Any only childs here? Oh, God bless you. God bless you. All right. So here's the thing, you know, when it comes to birth order and, and you know, firstborn, secondborn, thirdborn, only, you know, so many times we focus on the child, but boy, what a responsibility for the parent. What a responsibility to know, like, okay, how do I parent this type of child? How do I parent this type of child? How do I parent this type of child? And, and sometimes we forget, we, we celebrate birth order, but we forget about the fact that a parent has to ultimately know how to love and how to adapt and how to be consistent. See, sometimes I think that's where the family really breaks down is there's inconsistency. A parent can begin to play favorites. A parent can begin to really say, you know what, you're, you know, don't let the other two know, but you're my favorite, right? Like, there's that. And so we come to a passage in the Bible where there are two sons, and they're really different from each other. But what Jesus wants us to look at is not the difference in the two kids, but the singular love of a father who is consistent with both, who loves both equally, who shows grace equally. And it's the, it's the, what we know is the parable of the prodigal son, but I'm going to tell you right now, that is the worst name for this parable. It is actually the story of two lost sons. And if anything, it's the parable of the prodigal father. Matter of fact, that word prodigal means, and it's not a word we use too often, it means recklessly lavish. Meaning there's a God who is a spendthrift, who is sometimes we would perceive as undignified in the way he just loves and shows grace and shows mercy. And that's exactly the kind of God Jesus wants us to understand is is our heavenly father. So turn to Luke 15, and we're going to look at the parable of the prodigal God. Turn to Luke 15, and we're going to look at the parable of the two lost sons. And I believe God has a message for every single one of us in this room this morning because um, this is a powerful, powerful story. As a matter of fact, Charles Dickens and Ralph Waldo Emerson both called this the greatest short story ever told. And Dickens was someone who knew, who knew God. Emerson, not so much. But you know what? They both affirmed something, that there's some powerful truths in this story this morning. Now, you know the scene, and we've been kind of building this as we've been navigating through Luke together, is that Jesus is, is showing love to do two great groups of people. He's got the sinners and tax collectors, and that's all the riffraff, like you and me, right? <laughs> that he loves those people with lots of grace. And he welcomes them and he accepts them. And then there's the religious leaders, on the other hand, who are just kind of legalistic and self-righteous. And he's trying to love both groups. He's trying to let the the sinners and tax collectors know that there's nothing that they've ever done that can make them unlovable by God. But he also wants the religious leaders to know that 
They have to get rid of their self-righteousness because that just breeds pride. And it breeds unlovingness. And they need to change. And that God is consistent in his message. And the two sons in our story this morning represent two groups. And so I want us to look at this this morning. There's three points. And uh, let's read it in its entirety. And then we'll go back and, and talk about these three things. So there's three main characters. There's the younger son, there's the older son, and then there's the father. Starting at verse 11. So last week we talked about the lost sheep. We talked about the lost coin. Again, possessions that people sometimes frantically and feverishly look for if they lose them. But what about a lost person? There's nothing more valuable than a lost person to, to go find that person that's disconnected from God. Look at verse 11. So he says, a certain man had two sons. The youngest of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me and divide the wealth between us. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with sex, drugs, and rock and roll because that's what loose living is. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be in need. He had nothing left, right? So he went and attached himself to one of the citizens of that far country. And that citizen sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And I don't know how many of you worked with pigs, but it's got to be a dirty business, right? Verse 16, and he was longing, while he was working with the pigs, he was longing to fill his stomach with just the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. So this is a ri riches to rag story, right? And then verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have it better than me? How many of those men that are back at my father's house have enough bread, but here I am dying with hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired men. And that father got, so the son got up, came to the father, and while that son was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion for him, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father blurts in and says, quickly, bring out my best robe, put it on him, bring out the, the family ring, put it on his hand, and put sandals on his feet, and bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and be merry. Woo! For this son of mine was dead, and he's come to life again. He was lost and has been found, and they began to be merry. They began to celebrate. But the older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing, and he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what was going on. And the servant said to the older brother, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But that older brother became angry and was not willing to go in and celebrate. And the father came out and began to plead with the older son. And he answered the father and said, look, for so many years I've been a servant in your house and I've never neglected one of your commands and I've never even, you've never even given me a kid, you've never even thrown me a party that I might be married with my friends. But when this son of yours came, you have devoured your wealth with, who has devoured your wealth with harlots and you've killed the fattened calf for him. And he said, my child, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has now been found. May God write his eternal truth on our hearts this morning. Amen. There's a lot here. For every single one of us, there's something to understand with the younger son. There's something to understand with the older son. And then there's something glorious to understand about this father. So three points. The first is this. When it comes to the, the younger son, there are detestable sins and law-breaking joylessness in his life. So the younger son, obviously there's some dissatisfaction with his home life, right? There's, there's kids that grow up in houses and they sit there and they tell their parents, I can't wait till I'm 18 until I can get out of here. I cannot wait until I... I'm under, I come out from under your authority because I don't like the rules of this house. I want to go and live my life, right? Bon Jovi's their theme. It's my life. It's now or never. So the, the younger son basically goes to the dad 
And back in this culture, those kids got an inheritance. The older of two got two-thirds of, of dad's wealth, and the younger one got one-third. So this older son got a double portion. Essentially, the younger son goes to the dad and says, divide your estate now. I want my inheritance. Translated, I wish you were dead. Because a father could only divide his inheritance upon his death. So essentially, the younger son is, is so dissatisfied, so disenchanted with his dad, all he can think about is his own life, his own pursuits, and he has a dissatisfied heart. And, and, and let me tell you guys something. If there is dissatisfaction in your hearts, it will only lead to a disappointing life. You see this play out in this, in this kid's story. So he says, Dad, divide the inheritance, which literally... This father had to go and sell at this moment. Sell at this moment everything. Even though he could still run the land and be in charge of it, he was no longer owner of it. He, at that moment, basically in the community, said, I'm dead, I need to divide my inheritance. So the son takes, doesn't even, doesn't even give dad any time even like the, for the ink to dry, takes his share and leaves. Goes off to a distant country a far country. He wants his share of the inheritance now and he gets it. And here the father experiences, write this phrase down, rejected love. Because you're looking at the, the dad and you're going, this guy can't be all that bad. Home life may not be that bad, but whatever it is, this kid is dissatisfied and so now the father feels the pain, the agony of rejected love. Can I just tell you guys, sin, because this is what this, this young son is pursuing, Sin is like a psychosis, and it blocks us from thinking rationally. You may have heard me say this phrase before, and you, this is really good. You're gonna, you're, there's a few morganisms that you may want to write down for this morning. When in sin, you think insane. When in sin, you think insane. When you try to even rationalize things before a holy God in whom we live and move and have our being, if there's, if there's any tint of just doing something that's not according to his, his created creation or, or design, it, 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 there's no sanity there. And yet this father chooses to let his son go. There's no pleading. There's no fighting. He, he just gives his son what the son wants, which is, which is a hard parenting thing to wrap your mind around, right? Because my wife and I were fighting about this the other day. Yes, we fight. So we were fighting the other day about how we parent our kids. And I'm going to tell you right now, neither one of us was right or wrong. It's just a different approach. Can we celebrate differences? Yeah. But here's the thing. I, I have a hard time trusting my kids. And I had this conversation with them. I said, dad is learning the older you get to be more trusting of you. And so to have this father ha have this request be made of him from the younger son and just be like, go. I'm like going, no, I'm not that kind of dad. But this dad, this dad just says, my son will make his choices. I got to let him go. Is that a hard thing? Have you as a parent ever had to just let your kids go? And it's the hardest thing in the world. So this father lets the son go. So here's this kid, pockets bulging, confidence brimming. He sets off for an unbridled life. Thomas Huxley, who was no fan of Christianity, he said this, a man's worst difficulties begin when he's able to do just as he likes. Ladies and gentlemen, ultimate freedom is not freedom at all, but ultimately it's bondage. I'm going to talk about this here in a moment. All is not wine and roses, because here's the thing. This kid has shallow objectives. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And when you have shallow objectives, you attract shallow friends. And when you attract shallow friends, there's only shallow things you guys hang out and do together. And once the shallowness disappears and fades, what holds you together? Nothing. It's like two starving ticks on a dead dog. It's not pretty and it's lifeless. So here's this kid, right? He's out there having fun as long as he can cover the tab. The fun will only last as long as he's footing the bill. And can I just tell you guys, and I, and I know this from experience personally, I know this from talking to people, 
If you live only for yourself, you will realize one day you'll be only by yourself. That's the way a self-reliant life works. This kid is self-reliant. He says, Dad, I want to become detached from you, and I want to become self-reliant, only relying on myself. And now he's just beginning to understand the true cost of sin. Can I tell you guys something that when we break our attachment with God, when we break our attachment with the Father, your spirit is designed to attach to something. There is no such thing in this room this morning as a detached soul. And when you become attached to something else, it becomes about slavery and not sonship. Let me say this. This is deep, but you need to hear it. When your soul becomes a detached from, from God, who is our father, there's that longing to be a son or daughter of the king, but you cannot be that because you've detached yourself from the one who defines what that looks like and you become attached to something else. Something else or someone else doesn't give you sonship. It only gives you enslavement. Maybe we just need to say amen and go home because that's, like, that's intense. But every single one of us has a soul that is designed to attach to something. And I will tell you, there's too many of us in this room where we've experienced a dead end because we've begun to value things more than people. We've begun to value pleasure more than duty. And we've been uh, too consumed with distant scenes more than the blessings we have right here at home. You see the trap that this kid's fallen into? The basic problem with humanity is that we want the goodness of God and we want all the blessings of God, but we don't want God himself. We want the Father's stuff, but we don't want the Father. That, that's, that's something only your soul can, can search out right here, right now. That so many of us have been living for stuff and things, and God's saying, only I satisfy. Even the great C.S. Lewis, maybe you've never heard of him before, but... He said, perhaps if there's no desire in you that's been fulfilled by this world, perhaps you've been made for another world. And perhaps you've been made for someone else, and that's God. See, the problem is two things when it comes to detestable sins, right? All the things that you and I would say, oh, that's disgusting, that's shameful, right? That's, we want to live making choices without consequences, and we want to live with autonomy without accountability, the, those two mentalities that are so prevalent in, in our world, in our, in our communities, in, in our hearts, do, they do not lead to anything positive. When you have choices without consequences, what it means is you're going to just take all your moral reasoning and set it to the side. Because when in sin, you think insane. And then when consequences happen, we automatically think, oh, well, that's offensive and that's unjust and that's excessive. And you need to think, just like Jurassic Park. The problem isn't, can we do it? The question is, should we do it? And then what happens? Rah, velociraptors, right? Anyone have any velociraptors unleashed upon their life? Because it's not like, boy, I know I can do it. The question is, should I do it? Ideas have consequences, right? Number two, you want autonomy without accountability, meaning we think we live in a world where we just go ahead and make choices devoid of relationship. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't have relationship, you are going to lead a life of misery. Accountability is having people in your life that say, that's not a good decision. And they love you and they want what's best for you, but because we're so self-reliant and self-driven, we automatically say, nope, I'm going to celebrate my freedom, I'm going to celebrate my autonomy, but what we miss out on deeply is accountability. And this is what this kid is living. Wayward people want autonomy without the rule of love. So here he is. Look at his situation, right? Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. He can no longer pay the tab. He's now feeding pigs. Now, the Jew, this was the most disgusting, most degrading job in the world. Right? He is feeding pigs. Pigs were considered unclean animals. And all he can think of while he's sitting there in the mire, in the mud, is, boy, <laughs> I used to wear fine clothes. I used to drink fine wine. And I used to laugh with friends. 
And now I'm sitting here in the dirt. I thought money could buy friendship. I thought love could be rented, and it's not. See, sin promises freedom, but it can only bring about slavery. Sin pr promises success, but it can only bring about failure. Sin promises life, but it can only bring forth death. Let me, let me make a statement real quick. When God is not a part of your equation in life, enjoyment will always become enslavement. Remember what I said a few weeks ago and, and we were going to make t-shirts or bumper stickers or something? Jesus makes everything better. Jesus makes everything better. If not, you're, you're following the wrong Jesus. Because there's about a thousand guys in maximum security prison who all think they're the Messiah. <laughs> we're all following these little Jesuses and we're not following the true Jesus. Jesus, if the true Jesus is residing in your life, he will make everything better. And if your life is not better and it's not enjoyment, it's enslavement, guess what? You're following the wrong Jesus. It's in our messiness that God's mercifulness becomes magnificent. That's a Morganism right there. Tweet worthy. Someone get ready. It's in our messiness that God's magnificence or mercifulness becomes magnificent. When we've hit rock bottom and there's no other thought than God, then something magnificent is about ready to happen. Because notice when he comes to his senses, verse 17, what does he think about? My dad. When all is stripped away and you've got nothing to think about, what comes to your mind? It's going to be God. God. He had not forgotten his father's love. Because when you love like this as a parent, this, this father was an, an amazing guy to raise these two boys and to have them act the way they are because we haven't even got to the older son yet. But this guy is, this guy loves these kids. And true godly sorrow is on display in this young son's life. He's not crying over what he's lost. He's crying for what he has done to his dad. That's true repentance. That is godly sorrow. Godly sorrow is not being caught with your hand in the cookie jar. Ooh, cookies sound good right now. <laughs> godly sorrow is not making excuses. Godly sorrow is saying like the younger son, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. Full stop, period. See, when he sins against heaven, he's saying, I have sinned against God. All sin is ultimately a sin against God. Whether it be marriage, whether it be family, whether it be work, whether it be whatever, all sin is always a sin against God before anyone or anything else. And so here he goes. Here's where, here's where some of the, 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 the positivity comes in this, this young man's life and mind. And he says, I'm going to go home. But he also, he's also resigned in his heart that he can't go home and say, Dad, guess what? I'm home. Can I be your son again? Here's what he's resolved in his mind. I think my dad's hiring right now. I can get a job on the farm. I'll become a hired hand. So he rehearses the speech and says, Hey, Dad, I noticed the help wanted sign. Uh, can I become one of your, your, your hired men? Because in his heart, in his mind, he says, there's no way I can become a son. Because I've messed up so royally. And so he goes to his dad, prepares this speech, right? Because he thinks the gospel is a help wanted sign. Can I tell you right now, the gospel is not a help wanted sign. The gospel is a help available sign. Do you understand the difference? This younger son is broken and he's going to go and be broken before his dad and hopefully get a job at the farm and yet what he encounters is something so crazy he approaches home and guess who's already waiting for him his dad he sees his son far off and he knows perhaps he knows the silhouette the shape perhaps he knows the gait and how his son walks 
But that's what that father then does is so undignified and so against culture. He takes his toga, puts it in his belt, and runs like crazy. And his, the son's probably looking, going, who is that running toward me? Maybe he's never seen his dad run before because older men didn't run in this community. They were dignified. But the father runs. I can hear Vangelis playing Chariots of Fire. Dun, 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 dun. It was a Hallmark movie. There's dad. And I bet you, Dad, there was already tears come down his face. And the son can only think about getting hired on, earning back a place into the father's estate. And he's rehearsing the speech, he's rehearsing the speech, he's rehearsing the speech. And all the father is doing is running and crying. And the son barely gets his confession out when the father drapes himself around his son's neck and the tears are just gushing. There's a reason why Jesus uses this imagery because he's saying that none of us deserve a welcome like that because of what we've done. I mean, I wonder if the son for a moment thought, is he coming to chase me away? Right? Like, get out! Of <laughs> Got a bat, right? Like, here's the thing. There's nothing we have done when it comes to sin that is beyond the grace of God's reach. This is what he wants you to know. You can hit rock bottom. And the fact is that God still delights in meeting you in your brokenness. You can have absolutely nothing left of your life. You could have squandered everything that God has given to you. And what Jesus wants you to understand is that there is joy in heaven when one sinner repents. The father runs cries, weeps, praises, and says, let's celebrate. For my son who was lost is now found. I mean, the kid just wants a job. The father wants restoration to full sonship. Yeah. Think about this. We feel the weight of our sin. And for some reason, we still battle this idea that I think I can earn God's love. If I only just correct my behavior and change my attitude, I'll, I'll earn God's love. Can I just say right now, this is a full stop period. Get this out of your mind. It is a lie. You can never earn God's love, and he doesn't want you to earn it. He wants you to be broken and accept his lavish, prodigal love and realize that it is a quick restoration to full sonship or daughtership. That's how God accepts you. You cannot earn it, nor does he want you to. He wants you to embrace it and accept it and realize you are accepted into the family because of your brokenness. Blessed are those who are broken. Blessed those who are mourn, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. And you know what's amazing? Is that the father says, Look, we're going to throw a party. And he does four things. Side note, extra bonus points for you this morning. He gets a robe, he gets a ring, he gets sandals, and he gets the fattened calf. Why are these things important? Because the robe represented the, fa the, the authority, the position in the family. The father's robe. This is the father's robe. We have no idea if the son's even cleaned himself up. You remember where he's been? He's been in the pig slop. But the father doesn't care. See, this is not what God doesn't say. Before you come to me and wear my robe, go ahead and take a shower and clean up. He says, you stink like pig crap. And you are filthy from head to toe, but it doesn't matter. Get my robe, because once that robe is placed on you, you have position in his family. Get the ring, because the family ring was a signet ring, and it, it implied authority. And all the authority that, that the father had is now given to the son based upon the ring that is now slipped on his finger. The, the sandals that were placed upon this man's feet, because he had no shoes, because when you lose everything, you lose everything. And those who didn't wear shoes were beggars and slaves. And this father wants that kid to know that he's no longer a slave. He is now a child restored. Get those sandals on his feet. And then we're going to party. Get the fattened calf. Here's what's significant about the fattened calf. Because usually meat wasn't a part of the meals. Meat was a delicacy and it was only reserved for special celebrations. But not just that, the fattened calf, you know what that was reserved for? The day of atonement. The day during the year 
where we celebrate the delivering power of God. And what that father is saying is get that, get that fattened calf that's saved for that special day because today is that special day. He was lost, but now he's found. He was once lost, but now he has been restored. This is the day of atonement. And all God's people said, what? You guys, not only is the kid forgiven, he's restored. And it had nothing to do with him earning it. it had nothing to do with him making sure the speech was so well rehearsed. The father could tell the, the kid was broken. Maybe you're here and you think you're the worst sinner in the room. Maybe you're here and you're looking around going, man, I wish I had my crap together like all these other people sitting here. <laughs> Maybe you're here hearing this message and you don't know anyone here, but you're still finding it hard to believe that God could love unconditionally like this. He does. N don't take my word for it. Jesus himself is teaching this stuff. And all I know is that Jesus doesn't lie. Jesus makes everything better. So moment of laughter, because this is intense. Let's, let's have some levity. So I'm always one to, to find some unique things out there. So there's this real estate agent in Zephyr Hills, Florida. If you don't know where Zephyr Hills, Florida is, it's outside of Tampa Bay. Well, they posted a, uh, an ad for a house. And uh, I think some of us are going to identify with this house because it is literally the worst house in the street. Uh, Ryan's going to have some pictures up on here. So this real estate agent, imagine having this job. You're trying to sell this property. And, and here's what the description says. And I love this description. Here it is, literally the worst house on the street. The seller has done the hard work of cleaning up the almost half acre property. It only took seven dumpsters. So now is your chance to take it from here. Have you ever watched HGTV and thought, I could do that? If so, pack up your tape measure and start Googling how to identify a load-bearing wall because it's time to put your money where your mouth is. The roof leaks, the floor, floor creaks, and there's a terrible draft, but this three-bed, one-and-a-half bath home is very open concept. And by that, we mean the inside is open to the outside because several of the windows are broken. <laughs> There's a large sunny window in the kitchen and absolutely nothing else. A wonderful feature for someone interested in a bright reading space and ordering takeout for every meal. Now I know you've heard of a detached garage, but have you ever heard of a detached foundation? Well, that's because you'll find it here in the large bonus room at the right of the home. And if you're looking for a house that screams, I've got bizarre and ominous energy, then honey, stop the car because you found it right here conveniently located off US 301 in North Zephyr Hills. If you need a place to stage your next post-apocalyptic zombie movie, then here it is because it has those zombie vibes attached to it. Whether you like to turn up the heat or keep it cool, it won't matter because there's no HVAC system in this house. Oh, and don't forget about the brick chimney that perfectly epitomizes how we all feel about 2020, about to collapse and going nowhere. Literally, there's no fireplace inside the house. What else can we say about this one-of-a-kind opportunity? It's not in a flood zone and will be conveyed with clear title, but we don't have to survey and a, and a seller has never seen the opportunity, so buyers are strongly encouraged to do their own due diligence. And you're not, if you're not interested in crying yourself to sleep every night while you consider rehabbing this home, then we might suggest just tearing it down and building a brand new one in your place. The neighbors would likely thank you. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> And here it is, right? And I think many of us can identify with this home. We're, we're, we feel like we're the worst person on the street. And if God is going to write a description, I want him to write a description like that, where it's honest. And, and maybe the best plan of attack is to say, let's just tear it down and build something brand new. And that's exactly what happens to the prodigal son, younger son, Complete destitution leads to complete restoration. And those detestable sins and his law-breaking ways become fully forgivable with God. But then there's the older son. 
Oh, let me just tell you right now. There's a lot of older sons in this room. Because you're the older son, if you thought the younger son, you could look around and go, yeah, that person needs to hear that, that person needs to If you were that person, you're the older son, so we're going to talk about you now. Here's the older son, right? He's got the respectable sins and law-keeping joylessness. See, whether you're a law-breaker or a law-keeper, it ultimately leads to joylessness. The older son, the one who's bossy, the one who's strong-willed, the one who is, who is determined, the one that is just making all the right decisions, right? I think Jesus has more to say and is really focusing on the older son than he is the younger son. Because remember, who's listening? It's all the self-righteous religious leaders. So while the younger son is wallowing in his sins, the older son is working diligently on the estate. Let me say something, and let me be very clear about this. Don't be deceived. It is possible for elder brothers to leave the father without leaving the farm. You, you, you hear what I just said? It is perhaps the worst sinners are in the churches and not pimping their bodies on the street. Perhaps the worst sinners are right here and not at Casino Arizona. And I'm not saying if you go to the casino, you're a sinner. Just next time, invite me, okay? Perhaps the worst sinners ever gathered on a day of the week are Sunday mornings. Because there's so much self-righteousness that says, at least I'm better than that person. At least I'm better than my neighbor. At least I'm better than my coworker. Let me just tell you, you don't have to leave the farm to be distant from the father. Look at the elder son. You would have thought the older brother would be excited to have his younger brother home. Here's what I'm grateful for. You ever think about this? What if the older brother intercepted the younger brother upon his arrival before the dad did? <laughs> you ever think about that? Like, here's the older brother out there like, what the hell? Runs out and says, listen, jo Josiah, we're going to call him Josiah. Uh, listen, you broke dad's heart. You, you've squandered, obviously. Look at your, your mess. Let's just call this the end of a chapter. You're no longer welcome here. Go ahead and, go ahead and find life someplace else. Dad, dad's good without you. Aren't you glad the older son didn't meet the younger son first? It's kind of like that moment Gandhi walks into a church in India. And the, and the elders, deacons at that church blocked Gandhi from going into the church. And they basically said, yeah, you're not, you're not welcome here. And Gandhi left and never stepped foot in a church again. Because he says, if that's the way Christians love people, I don't want to have anything to do with it. I'm glad. I, 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 I don't like older sons. I sometimes act like an older son. But I wonder how many times I've acted like the older son. I've prevented people from coming to know God because of my self-righteousness. I'm glad the dad interceded first before the son. <laughs> But notice what happens. The arrival of a brother, right? He can't celebrate because the older brother's arrival is a threat. You know what the threat is? That God accepts us by grace because of simply of who God is, not for what we do. That's a threat to us. You mean I can't continue to prop up my superior merit? Over everybody else? I mean, will my superior merit as a, as a Christian be overlooked by somebody? I can't have sinners and tax collectors in here. See, the presence of the younger brother was a threat to the older brother. So he couldn't celebrate. And I'm going to tell you right now, you guys. The, the, the enemy is whispering two lies into our ears right now. He says there's two choices you can live. Either rebel and be happy or obey and be miserable. Here are the two sons. Rebellion leads to happiness. No, it doesn't. It leads to enslavement. But you can obey and be miserable. Why? Because God doesn't want your obedience. You know what he wants? Your hearts. The older son is focused on obedience. And for him, he's saying, join me in this path of obedience because it's lifeless. It's joyless. It's miserable. And in his world, his father wears a frown, heaven has no laughter, and holiness is ultimately a sacrifice. 
This is the life of self-righteousness. Write that word down, self-righteousness. The first son, the father experienced the agony of rejected love. Now the older son, he's, re, he's experiencing the agony of repulsed grace. The older son has no concept of what grace is all about. Here's a Morganism. Maybe your Twitter handle can't handle so much this morning, but here, here's one more. When obedience replaces love in your heart, it will grow into the flower of legalism. When your heart before God is motivated by obedience and not love, it will grow into a legalistic lifestyle. And legalism is lifeless. The older son is drinking from a bitter fountain. And there's four things that the bitter son communicates before the father that ultimately you need to check your hearts on and I know I've wrestled with this this week as I was preparing this. So whether the bitter, what's the bitter fountain look like? Number one, it's maintaining a life of duty. Notice what the older son says, I have always served you. Can I tell you that perhaps there's no more dangerous words when it comes to God. He doesn't want you serving him. He wants you to love him. Your identity is not a servant. Your identity is a child. The son, the older son can only think of his relationship with the father in terms of what he did as if position is dependent upon performance. And all the son needed to do, the older son needed to do is work. If I work, if I work, if I work, I maintain my position. That is such a lie. God doesn't want you to serve him. He wants you to love him. Number two, maintaining a life of pride. Never have I disobeyed you. Wow, this guy's got a good track record, doesn't he? Can I just tell you right there, the moment you say never have I made a mistake, never have I sinned, is the moment pride is just sinking its roots deep into your heart. Because in his mind, he was convinced of his own goodness. And when you're convinced of your own goodness, there is no room for improvement. He's arrived, right? Never have I sinned against you. I've, I've maintained a perfect record. Well, just in his boasting of that, he's failed. Number three, he maintained a life of blindness. You have never given me even a goat to have a party with my friends. Can, may I remind you, the father's already divided his estate. Two-thirds of the father's riches are the, are the older sons. But he's blind to it. Because here's what older brothers do. They're not consumed with what they have. They're consumed by what they don't have. Can I tell you how many of us are blind? Because we're ignoring what's right in front of us. And you know what causes blindness like this? when you start treasuring things instead of treasuring God. Our hearts are little idol factories and they'll never be satisfied. They'll never be content. They'll always be like, I need more, I need more, I need more. And the son can only say to the father, can you believe this? You have given me nothing. And the father's saying, but I've given you me. The last thing is maintaining a life of indifference. He doesn't care about his brother. He doesn't care about anyone but himself. And all that I can think that's running through the older brother's mind is the word fairness. Can you write down the word fairness? Boy, older sons, older kids, can I get an amen from the older children? We want justice. <laughs> write down the word fairness. And I'm going to tell you right now, you guys, relationships prosper on love, not fairness. If you want a relationship to prosper, you have to get rid of fairness. That takes a back seat. Love is what causes relationships to prosper and flourish. Now here's what's interesting. Jesus doesn't tell us what the older son does. He leaves it open. Because this is where the religious leaders have to respond. What will they do? 
What will you do? Do you have your life all together and your crap smells so flowery and so good? Lavender, I hear lavender's in. Does it smell like lavender? G.K. <laughs> Chesterton, who was a contemporary of C.S. Lewis, one day the, the papers in England ran, what's wrong with this world? That was the headline. Chesterton, Chesterton wrote, wrote in a letter and, and they published it. He says, um, dear newspaper, I am. Sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. Until you realize you're what's wrong with the world, nothing's ever going to get better. Some of you are like, oh, but that's not me. I got my... You're the older son. Let's wrap it up because here's what we can't miss out on. The love of the father who meets the wayward younger son, who pleads with the older resentful son. And here's what I want you to understand, the loving father Forgivable sins and law fulfilling joyfulness. Because God is the God who's the one who forgives sins. And no, no matter where you may be on the sin spectrum, and there's such a thing, right? Because we have utter debasement and we have utter obedience. And both are sinful. And God says, I forgive all of it. And when you come to know me, that, that there's no more law breaking, there's no more law keeping, what you need to understand is that God himself is the law fulfiller. And when you're the law fulfiller, there's joyfulness. The father is here. There's three things that we see in the life of the father, right? It is, a, is the fact that he lavishes love, uh, love upon us with passion. He lavishes us with promise and he lavishes us with praise. When you come to know God, he runs to you. He's tucking his toga in his belt and sprinting, probably pulling a hammock along the way, but he's running to you. And he's not just coming up to you and being like, hey, fist pump or shake a hand. He's draping himself around your neck and the tears are flowing and he's saying, welcome home. That is a God who lavishes us with passion. And he's not only a God who shows us passion in the way he, he treats us, there's a celebration there's a party, the word that this older son, you know, he hears music. The word in the, in the Greek, literally symphony. It's not just like one guy playing Bob Dylan on guitar, like, hey, everybody, let's sing, you know, if I had a hammer, right? No, it's not that. It's Beethoven's fifth, like, da 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 da, yeah! It's a symphony. There's passion. This is how much God loves us. He lavishes on us his passion. He lavishes on us promise. And he says, all that I have is yours. Let me ask you a question. How much of God is yours? All of it. This is not hard. How much of God's is yours? All of it. Why are you acting so needy? Why are you acting so empty? Why are you acting like you've hit a dead end? Why are you walking around going, hoo, hoo, hoo? You have God. If you have Christ, you have God. And the promise is this, all that I have is yours. And he lavishes on us praise. My son was lost, but now I'm found. He wants everyone to know. He's singing over you, right? Zephaniah, we talked about this last week. His song over us is my, my child was lost, but now they're found. Come party with me. Guys, this is incredible. The real prodigal in this story is the father. Insanely generous, extravagantly gracious, recklessly lavishing goodness upon us. Life is where the father is. That's it. Both boys experienced their father's grace. And boy, I tell you what, it was a grace that always, grace always pays a price. And this is only possible because there was one true elder brother who did pay our debt. The Bible called him Jesus. And the only way restoration happens, the only way reconciliation takes place is if you come to the cross. Because upon that cross is where heaven and hell meet. His holiness and our sinfulness. And you come as you are and you realize that there's full acceptance. 
There's full forgiveness. There's full restoration in that place. We sing a song here. Uh, what's the song? Who am I that you, the highest king would think of me? You know the song? Yeah. If the sun, what is it? How's it go? Sets free is free indeed, right? If you think about the lyric for that song, right? Who am I that the highest king should think highly of me? Right? Who who am I that God would move heaven and health to uh, heaven and earth to to love me? Because I'm going to tell you right now, you can recite your unworthiness to yourself. You can sit in a pigsty of your own sin. You can wonder how you even got here, how even God the King could receive you. And the answer is never going to be found in your inherent worthwhileness or in God's neediness for you. You are celebrated. You are crowned. You are kissed. You are loved because your true elder brother, Jesus, the one who does not moan when you are welcome home, went into the city after you and paid off your debts with his own life. He suffered for your sin and purchased your repentance. He has accepted you. Ladies and gentlemen, this kind of love truly transforms. What an amazing parable. What a beautiful parable. I can't tell you how many times my eyes welled up this week looking at this parable. It wasn't just because of seasonal allergies either. I mean, literally I was moved. But there's someone here that needs to know, no matter how far you have wandered, God's grace can still reach you. And even if you have not wandered in sin, but you've wandered in your obedience, but there's no relationship with God, God's grace can still reach you. Because our loving, prodigal God is that incredibly rich. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's stand, let's pray. You're too good to us, God. Thank you for today. This is a day that you have made. We are the people that you have created. And once again, you have reminded us that we have nothing apart from you. But Lord, no matter how far we may feel we have wandered, no matter how far we have fallen, no matter how far we have strayed, the message is clear. You are there. And you're there with open arms, and you're there with a big hug, and you're there with laughter and celebration because you want us to be welcomed back to your family. And it's all because of Jesus. Wow, what an amazing truth. What amazing grace. Thank you for being a prodigal God who perhaps in this world's eyes acts so undignified and so recklessly, but that's the God that celebrates us and you sing over us. Thank you, Father, for showing us such un conditional love. May we now live lives reflecting this love and this grace we've, ex we've received. May we walk in your, your truth. May we be people who continue to delight in you. Thank you for all that you have given us in Christ Jesus. Thank you for this, this group today. Guide our steps. May we make it our aim to bring you glory in everything we do and say. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give you great peace forever and ever. Amen. Have an awesome day, you guys.